to the public lecture series of Think Tank 2022, conducted monthly as a platform collecting inputs and sharing through an idea on situation of different conflicts around the globe and sharing experience on how those problems are being solved. Today, we have the great honor of having Ms. Moy to give the lecture on ASEAN and conflict resolution in Myanmar. Ms. Moye is a big expert on ASEAN and Myanmar issue with a 10 years experience working in the ASEAN Secretariat and a study of Birma, uh, Birma foreign policy implication for her dissertation for PhD. Currently, Dr. Moye is a senior fellow at ICES Yusof Ishak Institute in Singapore, and she has contributed to many companion on ASEAN, Southeast Asia, and Myanmar. Ms. Moye is a co-author of the book, Myanmar, Life After Nagis, published in 2009, a co-author of the book, Urbanization in Southeast Asia, Issue and Implication, published in 2012, and also the co-author of a recent published book, ASEAN and India, The Way Forward. As recently, we do not have more information about the update or current situation around Myanmar. I think our audience cannot wait to get to know Dr. Uh, Ms. Moy inside and updates on the Myanmar issue. Oh, so can I transfer the floor to uh, Ms. Moy? The floor is yours, please. Thank you. Maybe we got some. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, Dr. Ngo, for the kind introduction. My thanks also to my thanks also to the Asian Vision Institute uh, for giving me this chance to um, share with you uh, my, uh, my 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 uh, my views and update uh, of the uh, or, and and my assessment of. Um, ASEAN's response to Myanmar. Um, my internet connection is not very stable, so I'm trying to um, switch to a more stable connection source. Uh, so I apologize for a few minutes to please bear with me while I do that. Yes, please. I we have a PowerPoint that I will be going through uh, to, to uh, walk through walk the audience through discussion that I want to give today. I think you can share uh, your PowerPoint in here is okay. Uh, okay. Please, please, right. Uh, uh, so uh, if I could share the screen on my end, uh, I'll, I'll do that right now. And uh, I'll be happy to uh, take some questions. Um, after, after I uh, walk through the key points of uh, my discussion. So I'll share the screen from my end. So I have uh, titled my presentation um, along the lines of, uh, you know, uh, the Myanmar crisis in ASEAN, uh, because we are looking at ASEAN's uh, response to the Myanmar crisis that has erupted after the coup uh, by the Myanmar military in February 2021. And um, I would just like to look at, you know, what are the kind of implications, opportunities and limitations, uh, because this is uh, now uh, entering its uh, third year, it's already halfway through the third year since the 2021 coup. And uh, I, I'm, I am aware that uh, this uh, this presentation, this uh, discussion is being live streamed. Uh, all the uh, views and uh, assessments presented are my own and uh, do not represent those of my institute. Uh, I think every one of us will be quite familiar with this picture. Uh, this is the special ASEAN leaders meeting in April 2021, uh, convened about two months after the coup uh, for the leaders, the heads of state and government of the nine ASEAN member states to meet with the coup leader, Senior General Min Aung Hlai, uh, to discuss uh, how to um, how to uh, go about uh, resolving uh, what had erupted in terms of the um, 
the resistance, uh, the uh, you know the resistance to the coup and also uh, to, uh, to 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 discuss with the senior general uh, the importance of not using lethal violence against unarmed civilian protesters because very soon after the coup in uh, February 2021 um, the the unarmed peaceful protests and the civil disobedience movement were met with use of lethal force and uh, this created uh, further escalation and spiraling of uh, conflict uh, to the point that uh, we are witnessing and hearing and reading about today. So um, you will see that this uh, is uh, the source of all these numbers is from Reporting ASEAN. It is a media it is a media outlet that tries to track um, developments within uh, Southeast Asia and report on it. And uh, for the Myanmar coup, reporting ASEAN has been uh, monitoring the situation and also giving out these kinds of infographics uh, to give a quick snapshot of uh, you know the Myanmar story in numbers. So what you can see here, of course, is six months after the coup and uh, what happened was basically as a result of the civil disobedience movement, uh, quite a significant portion of uh, the national uh, government activity, the daily activities, the functioning of the bureaucracy uh, came to a halt. Um, the World Bank actually reported that uh, Myanmar experienced um, a negative GDP growth in uh, 2021. Uh, as a result of uh, the coup and compounding uh, effects from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but uh, businesses were still hopeful that uh, there would be uh, some kind of uh, stability, even though uh, there were cash flow shortages. Uh, straight away, the uh, reputational impact of the coup could be seen in the kind of uh, the fall in FDI commitment. Uh, there were projections about um, the, the rise in poverty and food insecurity. And uh, of course, the displacement numbers and everything also arose. And this is, as I mentioned, six months after the coup. If you uh, check the reporting ASEAN uh, website, you will see much more of those um, Myanmar story in numbers. One year after the coup, the displacement numbers really increased. So uh, within the country, this, these were people who had been displaced uh, across Myanmar since the coup, uh, most notably in the central part of Myanmar in the Gain region, where uh, there's a lot of continued clashes even to today. And uh, there are also, you can compare that with the number of internally displaced people before the coup, and they were mostly in Rakhine state uh, uh, due to the uh, disproportionate military response against the Rohingya communities there that had created um, uh, an exodus across the border to Bangladesh. And so you will see in the numbers how there are uh, many Myanmar people living in insecurity um, as a result of uh, what had happened on the 1st of February, 2021. And this infographic is two years after the Myanmar coup, which focuses uh, on looking at the humanitarian needs in Myanmar, which have increased uh, very steeply since the February, 2021 coup. And uh, reporting ASEAN's um, summary really highlights that uh, the needs are growing more acute, even more so uh, after the uh, Cyclone Mocha aftermath in, uh, in, in, um, in Rakhine State and across other states and regions in Myanmar uh, in May, in mid-May. Uh, Cyclone Mocha made landfall in mid-May 2023. And so uh, basically this shows how acute the needs are, but um, the the uh, proportion, the amount that uh, actually is being funded um, is is still quite low. Um, okay, this is just a quick recap of uh, the timeline of the Myanmar crisis in 2021. Um, 2021 was when it all started and it was also when ASEAN's uh, response uh, took shape in the form of the five-point consensus, as well as uh, the very uh, 
I would say, unprecedented decision by the uh, ASEAN uh, Foreign Minister's emergency meeting in October uh, 2021 to limit Myanmar's representation at the ASEAN table, particularly the high-level political meetings such as the ASEAN summit and later on the foreign minister's meeting to what is called non-political representative, which effectively bars um, the, the coup leader, uh, the, the, the chair of the State Administration Council, uh, Senior General Min Aung Hlai, uh, or his uh, appointed or designated uh, ministers uh, from attending ASEAN's high-level political meetings, such as the summit or the foreign minister's meeting. And that decision made in October uh, 15, uh, 2021, holds to this day. It was first applied for the 38th and 39th ASEAN summits that were hosted and chaired um, virtually uh, by Brunei Darussalam, which was the ASEAN chair in 2021, and it has continued through Cambodia's ASEAN chairmanship in 2022. In fact, it was under in, uh, Cambodia's uh, ASEAN chairmanship that the decision to expand the non-political representative criteria to the foreign minister's meeting, uh, that was made in February 2022. And uh, up to now, in 2023, Indonesia's ASEAN chairmanship continues to uphold uh, this, this, uh, this principle of the non-political representative criteria when it comes to the Myanmar seat um, at ASEAN summits and foreign ministers meetings. Um, this timeline and the discussion of uh, the, the Myanmar crisis, uh, you can find it at this link, which I provided for further reference. So basically, the April 2021 ASEAN leaders meeting uh, agreed, discussed and agreed on the five point consensus, which is uh, continues to be the framework. I, I view the five point consensus as the framework for ASEAN's response to the Myanmar crisis. And this is a summary um, that has been um, uh, shared uh, by the um, ASEAN Information Center uh, in Thailand, uh, which basically summarizes the, um, the, the five-point consensus details. So you will see there that the first and most important priority uh, so for, for the other priorities to proceed is really the cessation of violence. ASEAN leaders called for the immediate cessation of violence. Uh, but uh, that has uh, not been uh, complied with or adhered to. And of course, um, what ASEAN wanted to see was a constructive dialogue, again, among all parties concerned. So it was really uh, to involve all the key stakeholders uh, affected in uh, or uh, involved in uh, the the uh, the crisis that uh, erupted after the coup uh, to to try to uh, engage in constructive dialogue and uh, have this dialogue process mediated by a special envoy of the ASEAN chair. And of course, the special envoy of the ASEAN chair would try to uh, meet with all the stakeholders, all parties concerned uh, in order to facilitate that dialogue process. Another important priority was recognizing the humanitarian needs of the communities in Myanmar and um, trying to facilitate and provide humanitarian assistance through the AHA Center, the ASEAN uh, Coordinating Center for Humanitarian Assistance. And of course, one of the, uh, the, the mandates of the the uh, special envoy of the ASEAN chair was to uh, visit Myanmar to again meet with all parties concerned towards uh, seeing how uh, the special envoy of the ASEAN chair could uh, mediate, facilitate, uh, bring about a constructive uh, dialogue. So this is just a quick recap of the five point consensus. But uh, the parallel uh, national unity government which formed on um, 16th of April, 2021, uh, comprising largely of the elected lawmakers from the 2020 election, um, 
which actually saw the uh, National uh, League for Democracy government returned to a second term in office, uh, basically lawmakers, elected lawmakers and um, civil society uh, representatives and ethnic um, representatives are all combined to form the National Unity Government of Myanmar. Uh, what the National Unity Government uh, cautioned in 2022 regarding uh, the five point consensus um, uh, implementation really was that um, violence had been continuing. So they were trying to highlight the NUG, the National Unity Government was trying to highlight that uh, there had been continuing violence despite ASEAN's call uh, in April 2021 for the cessation of violence. Um, Again, it uses open source data to uh, provide the infographic. So uh, the implications really, uh, the implications of the Myanmar crisis, if you look at the security implications, uh, there were the human and health security implications. Of course, in 2021, uh, there was still the COVID-19 pandemic that was uh, raging across uh, different countries and region, and also uh, the effects of uh, the different waves of the COVID-19 infection. And of course, uh, in Myanmar, uh, the concern about how those, um, how, how people would uh, be vaccinated, uh, whether vaccinations uh, would reach all the communities in need, all the medical attention, uh, despite, um, all, uh, amidst all these, um, uh, the conflict and displacements happening there, well, that was a big concern about human and health security. Of course, there there's also the, the human security concerns resulting from the clashes uh, between um, the Myanmar military and the forces resisting the military and the coup. Uh, there were also border security and tensions. Uh, and what was recorded since December 2021 was, of course, uh, the types of uh, attacks uh, by the Myanmar military on uh, villages close to the border. Uh, which has uh, only escalated since then. And uh, of course, uh, that would be uh, resulting also in uh, refugees into Thai territory. So uh, whether it is an opportunity or a limitation, I think we need to really look at uh, what are the uh, kind of uh, broad uh, concerns and principles that ASEAN has. Uh, of course, ASEAN always highlights the uh, importance of sovereignty and, and non-interference, but uh, one little uh, discussed point about ASEAN's non-interference principle is that actually, if it comes to regional security, uh, that non-interference principle uh, can be can be exercised uh, flexibly in the sense that ASEAN countries do have uh, the 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 opportunity and the window to intervene uh, in any situation if regional security and regional stability are affected. So. So basically, we need to look at it in that context about uh, regional security. When does a, a, a situation in, in one part of ASEAN or in an ASEAN member country constitute a, a concern for regional security? And then how should ASEAN react? Actually, ASEAN has intervened in uh, Myanmar before in the past for this uh, priority uh, that relates to regional security and uh, instability. For example, the, two, the 2008 uh, Cyclone Nagis, a humanitarian disaster, ASEAN actually negotiated uh, the breakthrough that allowed humanitarian actors, regardless of nationality or affiliation, to go to to all uh, parts of the uh, country where there were cyclone affected victims and survivors uh, for assistance and um, uh, relief and later on assisting with recovery. So that was a first for ASEAN as well in terms of putting humanitarian boots on the ground. Uh, the other, um, I think, uh, point about whether it's opportunity or limitation, we need to look at what does ASEAN centrality mean in terms of um, internal the ASEAN uh, members themselves uh, regarding and respecting ASEAN centrality as uh, important, you know, 
the, the centrality of ASEAN's decisions. Internally, do the ASEAN members uh, respect and uphold that? And externally, does ASEAN's partners and in, uh, external interlocutors uh, also respect and uphold ASEAN's central role? And of course, uh, what are the institutions that are upholding and asserting ASEAN centrality? And I think the Myanmar crisis has also uh, highlighted the importance of chairmanship and leadership uh, going hand in hand. Uh, these are just some pictures just to um, alleviate the monotony of my presentation. Uh, this is the, um, the screen grab of the uh, virtual uh, meeting, emergency foreign ministers meeting in October 2021 that made the decision in the presence of the uh, foreign minister representing the state administration council regime uh, about uh, limiting Myanmar's representation at ASEAN summits to non-political representative. And uh, following that um, decision, you can see that at the 38th and 39th ASEAN summit, um, the Myanmar screen was blank, upholding this principle at the summit level. Um, China, which uh, celebrated um, a special commemorative um, anniversary uh, with ASEAN, also, upheld the ASEAN principle. And that uh, is uh, something that uh, we also need to kind of remember in terms of the extent of um, ASEAN's dialogue partners upholding um, ASEAN centrality. So you will see the Myanmar screen is blank. That was the first instance of an ASEAN uh, meeting with uh, an important dialogue partner uh, upholding and implementing that non-political representative criteria. Um, then, of course, 2022 was when Cambodia took over the ASEAN chairmanship. Uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen tried to exercise his own form of uh, comb combining chairmanship and leadership in proposing um, to share Cambodia's experience uh, with, uh, with, with the peace plan and uh, trying to uh, uh, implement the priorities of the five-point consensus by visiting Myanmar. And there were a lot of comments regarding Prime Minister Hun Sen's uh, approach. Uh, you will see that this is a picture taken in January 2022, meeting uh, the coup cool leader, Senior General Min Aung Hai, in Nebido. Um, and uh, but very soon, uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen also realized that uh, the the State Administration Council in Myanmar uh, interpreted or viewed the five point consensus uh, implementation in a very different way from how ASEAN uh, views and uh, uh, wants to implement it. So uh, here you will see Prime Minister Hun Sen having a video conference with Senior General Min Aung Hlaing to again. Uh, highlight to him the importance of uh, implementing the five-point consensus. Um, and then uh, because of the continued, uh, I think, conflation by the State Administration Council in Myanmar, uh, that they, they would implement or address the five-point consensus only after uh, they had uh, addressed their own uh, roadmap. Uh, also, it was a five-point roadmap. Because of that conflation, um, very soon the decision was made uh, in February 2022 uh, for the AMM retreat, the ASEAN foreign ministers meeting retreat uh, to extend, expand that non-political representative criteria uh, to the foreign ministers uh, meeting level. So again, this you will see that uh, the Myanmar seat was uh, blank here. Uh, there's the uh, press statement uh, link if uh, you are interested to uh, look it up for reference. Um, and then also under the uh, five-point consensus uh, framework, uh, the special envoy of the ASEAN chair for 2022, uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of Cambodia, Mr. Praxokhan, visited uh, Myanmar in two working visits in March and June. Um, and uh, you will see uh, the different uh, kind of reports and analyses, uh, the links that I have provided there. Uh, Mr. Praxokhan's focus was on uh, humanitarian assistance, um, trying to facilitate humanitarian assistance to the communities in Myanmar, and also trying very hard to, to meet all parties and stakeholders concerned, um, which uh, 
was not possible during uh, his term. And now in 2023, what we have been seeing and hearing and reading about uh, Indonesia's chairmanship, Indonesia's ASEAN chairmanship, there were a lot of expectations uh, with regard to what uh, Indonesia's approach would be, because Indonesia had also been one of the uh, very uh, vocal ASEAN members uh, regarding uh, the coup and the response to the coup, and also uh, one of the uh, ASEAN members that uh, were upholding the principled approach of um, the, the non-political representative criteria. So there was uh, uh, the retreat of the ASEAN foreign ministers in February 2023. Indonesian foreign minister Redno Marsudi emphasized again uh, that it's um, it's important to have a united approach to the Myanmar response and that um, uh, Indonesia wanted to work towards inclusive national dialogue, which was key uh, towards any peaceful resolution uh, to the current Myanmar conflict. Uh, her emphasis on the united approach also uh, had reference to some unilateral moves that had been made uh, with regard to holding regional talks um, among uh, the neighboring uh, countries or the mainland Southeast Asian countries uh, with the uh, foreign minister of the State Administration Council. Um, and uh, there were also proposals by Thailand uh, to have track 1.5 meetings uh, as a complementary approach for jumpstarting uh, political dialogue. Uh, but uh, these meetings were not inclusive in the sense that it did not um, uh, me, uh, include or invite uh, all the key or the some of the key uh, stakeholders. It only invited the State Administration Council representative. And of course, uh, what uh, Indonesia's um, interest uh, to further implement the five point consensus was to really work towards involving everybody, including everybody, uh, so that uh, the national dialogue with uh, all the key stakeholders concerned, hearing all their views uh, could be uh, could be facilitated. Um, so there were also a lot of expectations for the 42nd ASEAN summit in uh, May 2023. Uh, Indonesia's approach has been quiet diplomacy. Uh, prior to the ASEAN summit in May, uh, Foreign Minister Redno uh, shared with the media that there had been over 60 engagements uh, regarding Myanmar uh, and also including with uh, different stakeholders in Myanmar, uh, including with the National Unity Government, um, the State Administration Council, also uh, the United Nations and other dialogue partners. Um, and, and other key stakeholders from, from ethnic and civil society uh, in uh, Myanmar to really look at uh, how to bring about, uh, you know, this, this uh, inclusive dialogue in the future. Foreign Minister's Red Nose observations were that the differences in the positions of stakeholders are wide and deep, which indicates the nature of uh, any uh, quiet diplomacy approach that should continue uh, will uh, will uh, take longer uh, in in terms of uh, helping to rebuild um, uh, rebuild trust, rebuild confidence, and also establish uh, really ascertain uh, the the concerns and and the aspirations of the different stakeholders. So at the 42nd ASEAN summit that was held in May in Labuan Bajo in Indonesia, uh, the, the last paragraph in the chairman's statement uh, basically reiterated uh, the position of the five point consensus, ASEAN's unified position, uh, having the five point consensus as the main reference. Um, I would interpret this as it is the, the framework. It continues to be the framework, but for the specific implementation, uh, there needs to be some kind of uh, further uh, further formulation of uh, more specific actions and approaches. But as the framework, ASEAN still retains the five point consensus, as well as uh, the review and decision on the implementation of the five point consensus, which the leaders adopted last year um, at the end of uh, Cambodia's ASEAN chairmanship. And uh, the ASEAN leaders have also uh, supported continued engagement with all 
stakeholders in Myanmar. So they wish to continue these kinds of, uh, I think, the quiet diplomacy engagements uh, with all key stakeholders, not just one or one main stakeholder, but all key stakeholders. Um, and uh, there was also a, a recognition of ASEAN's efforts to uh, deliver humanitarian aid to the people of Myanmar, uh, despite um, a challenging security situation, which actually referred to uh, the attack by uh, unnamed uh, perpetrators on a convoy of the ASEAN Humanitarian Assistance Coordinating Center. Um, with officials from the AHA Center and also, also officials from uh, two ASEAN embassies in Myanmar, uh, the Indonesian and the Singapore embassies, um, that that convoy was uh, attacked by unnamed perpetrators. And of course, ASEAN uh, condemned that attack. And uh, again, the summit statement also urged immediate cessation of violence uh, so that uh, what ASEAN needed to do in terms of humanitarian assistance and of course, trying to facilitate uh, inclusive dialogue could be uh, continued. So um, against this backdrop of the summit, what had happened was in the working dinner of the foreign ministers, I think uh, people will have read about this, uh, there was an open call by some ASEAN member states to invite uh, Myanmar, but when it says Myanmar, it actually meant the uh, State Administration Council. So there were uh, some sharp exchanges on this matter, but nevertheless, in a leaked report of the ASEAN Foreign Minister's Working Dinner, uh, it was noted that some ASEAN member states had uh, called for uh, engaging uh, the State Administration Council um, and, 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 you know, inviting uh, Myanmar back. Uh, there's also uh, this uh, point about not letting the Myanmar issue affect the, the overall progress of ASEAN community building and also that ASEAN might be experiencing a Myanmar fatigue. So the, the recognition that there's going to be no quick fix to the Myanmar crisis um, is, is already implicit in that and that uh, patience, flexibility and creativity are required. So uh, I think this is where we are in terms of um, where, where, where ASEAN's response to the Myanmar crisis is right now is um, the default position is uh, still continuing to uphold the uh, non-political representative criteria, uh, barring the State Administration Council Chair and uh, his appointed foreign minister to ASEAN's high-level meetings. But um, with uh, the divergent views within ASEAN, as we have seen recently happening, uh, the question, of, of course, is that, you know, we, we, how, how can we continue to uphold even that, um, that, that uh, non-political representative criteria position uh, for the summit and the foreign ministers' meetings? Um, I think it's also becoming quite clear um, since 2021 that the international community has placed the responsibility of dealing with the Myanmar crisis on the shoulders of ASEAN. What we are also seeing is humanitarian assistance becoming uh, the kind of like the focus of what uh, uh, external uh, partners, including ASEAN, uh, view that they can do uh, in terms of addressing uh, the situation in Myanmar uh, amidst the spiraling violence. And we are also seeing more uh, use of the words consultation, inclusion, and uh, Myanmar-owned, Myanmar-led um, in the language of the ASEAN statements in uh, responding to the Myanmar crisis. Um, I think I should um, stop there uh, for, for the time being. Uh, I'm aware of the time and perhaps during the question and answers session that follows, uh, we could address some other points that I could highlight. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Moore, for the insightful uh, presentation that recap all the whole picture of the Myanmar crisis from the beginning of uh, 2021. And also uh, you have elaborated also the uh, past, no, the recent uh, activity that happened in the Asian uh, community to solve or to address to the uh, crisis. It's very interesting. One one interesting thing that uh, I would like you to maybe to uh, 
uh, elaborate more about the uh, concept of sovereignty that you raised that uh, sovereignty is very important for ASEAN, but uh, ASEAN can be the window that can intervene into uh, the ASEAN state member to solve some uh, some issue. This is like uh, maybe it's a, a, a very crucial concept that I would like to ask you to maybe a little bit, a uh, little bit. You raised about the human uh, humanitarian uh, aids that we have do it, but we do it on uh, on this field only. But it's not political. It's non political. It's non uh, 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 like intervene uh, intervention in other fields. So please kindly uh, elaborate a bit a little, a little bit more. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ngo. You were mentioning about the uh, elaborate a bit more on the humanitarian assistance uh, approach by ASEAN or the ASEAN centrality approach. Uh, on your slide, you have one slide that said about the uh, sovereignty. And, ah, yes. Uh, okay. Yes. And then uh, we suppose that sovereignty of uh, uh, in ASEAN is very important. No one can intervene into mm -hmm. uh, uh, our state. And then uh, you say that uh, by your idea, so uh, ASEAN can be the window and can intervene to uh, some uh, affair in uh, in uh, the state of the uh, of the member of the member state. So maybe right. you can elaborate. Right. On okay, that. thank you. Uh, that's an important question about uh, sovereignty and, and non-interference, which are uh, principles enshrined in the ASEAN Charter. Um, I will uh, address uh, your your uh, question first, uh, Dr. Ngo, and I also see a question in the uh, Q and A box, um, and I'll link uh, I will link my answer uh, to to that question uh, as as well. So uh, as I mentioned. Sovereignty and non-interference, these are important principles, not just for ASEAN. If we look at it, if we look at the United Nations Charter, these are also important principles uh, that govern the conduct of um, sovereign states uh, with regards to um, international affairs as well. So uh, basically, uh, when we talk about uh, sovereignty, respecting sovereignty, and also the non-interference principle, what we mean, of course, is that um, uh, we we do not violate uh, another country's uh, sovereignty uh, by by uh, intervening in what is uh, described as their domestic affairs or their internal affairs. And this is, of course, uh, premised on the assumption that every sovereign state uh, should be able to uh, manage their internal matters in a manner in a manner that uh, is um, that that, uh, you know, takes into recognition the unique circumstances of each country's um, uh, internal situation. So that's that's the basic uh, understanding, the premise and, and the assumption. And of course, uh, it is also based on the historical experience of many of the countries in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, you know, perhaps with the exception of Thailand, uh, which was uh, largely uh, viewed and treated as a kind of buffer state by the colonial powers. Uh, almost all the rest of the uh, Southeast Asian countries have experienced the extreme form of intervention or interference of sovereignty, which is the extreme form of interference is, is um, you know, colonialization, annexation of your, your sovereign power by a, another foreign country. So I think um, with that historical experience, uh, this kind of principle, of course, uh, was uh, deemed quite important to the members of uh, ASEAN uh, when they first uh, started to uh, started founding the association and so on. But um, what I want to say here is, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation as well, ASEAN does have uh, this kind of um, further interpretation of what can constitute a situation for ASEAN countries to uh, intervene constructively. So of course, no invasion, therefore there will be no kind of military intervention, right? Because ASEAN, I, I, I'm sure with Cambodia's historical experience in the past, uh, this, this was uh, very much highlighted. ASEAN stood on principle against invasion of uh, Cambodia's um, sovereign 
uh, territory, in te territorial integrity, but uh, the circumstances surrounding that had a different uh, political, humanitarian, as well as geopolitical implications. But we're talking about Myanmar today, so let me focus on how ASEAN has interpreted uh, the constructive uh, kind of intervening in another country's um, situation if, if a crisis erupts that merits uh, this kind of intervention and response. I mentioned the 2008 humanitarian uh, disaster in Myanmar after Cyclone Nagis. And because of that, um, the, the devastating uh, effect of the cyclone and uh, the refusal by the military regime at that time, uh, it was a previous military regime called the State Peace and Development Council, and they were uh, refusing or blocking uh, humanitarian assistance or the humanitarian actors to, to reach the cyclone affected areas and help the survivors. And um, what happened was ASEAN actually uh, point blank uh, asked the uh, foreign minister of the State Peace and Development Council in Myanmar at the time, what does ASEAN mean to you? And you know, ASEAN's intention is to help the people of Myanmar. So what are you going to do? And uh, very surprisingly and interestingly, the, 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 uh, the Myanmar regime at that time, um, the Myanmar military regime at that time agreed to have um, humanitarian actors and agencies from all over the, the, the world, regardless of nationality, regardless of affiliation, you know, regardless of the political affiliation or whatever, to, to enter Myanmar and to, to reach those areas, basically provide, you know, that kind of direct response to the survivors, as long as ASEAN coordinated that approach. And because of that, there was this tripartite mechanism that involved uh, the authorities in Myanmar, ASEAN, and um, UN in a tripartite consultation because the common aim was to help the people of Myanmar. So with this in mind, there was this uh, flexibility to what constitutes an important uh, situation for regional security such that ASEAN can have a constructive intervention. And of course, the concern for regional security at that time was that uh, people are dying, people will be trying to uh, uh, maybe cross the border and uh, find, um, find refuge. And so it would affect regional stability. So using that, ASEAN always has that as the uh, kind of institutional memory and, uh, you know, of, uh, kind of uh, past experience when, when dealing with Myanmar. So when the Rohingya crisis uh, happened in uh, 2016 and 17, uh, ASEAN also tried to uh, provide that um, humanitarian coordinating role uh, to also be able to monitor what the Myanmar authorities, by that time it was the National League for Democracy government, what the Myanmar authorities were doing uh, with regard to uh, facilitating the return of the Rohingya communities back from Bangladesh. But the pandemic disrupted all of that. And then during the pandemic, the coup happened after uh, the National League for Democracy actually won a second landslide. So with that as a backdrop, I think uh, the way that ASEAN interprets um, uh, this non interference principle when it comes to Myanmar has very uh, clear precedents uh, that ASEAN can build on and that is what ASEAN has tried to do. In fact, uh, we can also observe or assess that ASEAN has always, um, you know, whenever it comes to being tested by a crisis situation, and most of the times since 1997, it has been uh, with regard to uh, situations or developments in Myanmar, ASEAN has always, uh, I think, established new precedents of how a regional response can be uh, in, in you know, uh, uh, addressing the situation in the country. So in 2008, we saw how ASEAN addressed it. Uh, again, um, following that in uh, 2016 and 17, and in 2021, it, it, it set this precedent. Never before has ASEAN uh, taken this step to indicate to a member state that if you do not uh, in, adhere to an ASEAN decision, if you do not have that respect, the internal respect for ASEAN centrality, this is what will happen. And this is because ASEAN still views Myanmar as a member state. Um, right now, 
uh, there is a kind of like a, a vacuum or a void in terms of who represents Myanmar officially in a recognized manner. Uh, because uh, I think most of the ASEAN member states will always uh, go back to the results of the 2020 elections. ASEAN member states actually welcomed and congratulated uh, the, the 2020 election result, and uh, they were uh, looking uh, at the second term uh, to be taken up by the National League for Democracy, and then the coup happened. So ASEAN's position is rather clear, and until such time that the crisis in Myanmar uh, has uh, has uh, become uh, a situation where the response, ASEAN's response in terms of the five point consensus framework, actually uh, we see compliance on the Myanmar side by the State Administration Council with regard to uh, cessation of violence, as well as uh, really working together with ASEAN on the kind of the humanitarian assistance to reach all the communities in the country, regardless of where they are or in which region or which part of the country they are, not just to like approved areas uh, by the State Administration Council. I think these are the kind of good faith things that ASEAN wants to see. And, and of course, uh, that is how uh, the, the non-interference principle has been um, uh, kind of uh, interpreted flexibly with regard to regional security uh, taking precedence. So I hope that uh, that, that uh, helps to give more context to your question, Dr. Ngo. And in that regard, uh, we can look at um, uh, Che Lim's question about um, the, uh, in the current Indonesia approach. Um, because Indonesia's approach on quiet diplomacy uh, also respects to a certain extent the uh, the 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 non-interference in the sense that uh, it is a constructive intervention. It is trying to engage all the key stakeholders constructively uh, towards uh, finding uh, this 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 common starting ground, this common baseline, if you will, a common starting point for the um, different stakeholders uh, in Myanmar. Uh, towards, you know, uh, having that um, dialogue. Right now, because the positions, as Foreign Minister Redno had observed, the divergent views among the Myanmar stakeholders are quite wide and deep. What Indonesia's quiet diplomacy is trying to do with all these many, many engagements uh, for, for several of the key stakeholders, including the ethnic um, uh, organizations, the ethnic resistance organizations, the ethnic armed groups, um, they are trying to find out, OK, what are all the aspirations? What are all the concerns? You know, Myanmar has been under uh, some form of an internal uh, civil war situation uh, between the Myanmar military and the different ethnic armed groups uh, for, for decades since now. So there are all these, uh, uh, you know, the past uh, history of concerns, of, of uh, aspirations that have never been met since uh, independence. And so uh, what, what uh, now uh, I, I think the ASEAN response under Indonesia's chairmanship this year is, is starting to, uh, to realize and appreciate or understand better is that um, we, we cannot move towards uh, forcing any kind of um, externally uh, facilitated solution on Myanmar until the stakeholders in Myanmar themselves um, have some broad understanding or agreement on what is the common, you know, the common starting point for everyone to to be able to sit around the table. So I think that is um, that is uh, the the kind of um, uh, realization that is setting in. Uh, we don't have much information this year about the office of the special envoy. Uh, we can uh, assume, I guess, with some uh, level of um, certainty that following the past uh, experience of uh, Brunei in 2021 as the ASEAN chair, Cambodia in 2022 as the ASEAN chair, perhaps to all intents and purposes, the special envoy, if we have to have that kind of a label or a position, uh, would naturally be the foreign minister of the chair country. But because of the nature of all of these engagements and quiet diplomacy that Indonesia is uh, uh, you know, engaging in with the different Myanmar stakeholders at different levels, uh, at different uh, in different types of settings, 
um, there is now the office of the special envoy that Indonesia tried to institutionalize. Currently, it's in the Indonesian foreign ministry. So I understand the head of that office. It's not the special envoy, but it's the head of the office of the special envoy uh, who is helping to coordinate many of these engagements on the ground. Um, uh, Ambassador Ngura Swajaya, uh, he has also been trying to represent uh, the, the special envoy and the ASEAN chair in that sense in, in conducting these engagements. Why we don't have information? I think um, Cambodia's experience has also shown uh, quite uh, clearly that there is so much interest and so high expectations on ASEAN uh, to, to do something about the Myanmar crisis that whenever there is some movement or some action or some activity, there is a lot of attention and scrutiny and, and you know, every move, every step is uh, really uh, scrutinized and, and also a, a lot of comments come out. So, um, I think Indonesia probably also learned from uh, the very uh, high level of scrutiny uh, on uh, the, the ASEAN response uh, that was, uh, you know, the efforts made during Cambodia's chairmanship. And, and they thought that, okay, uh, if, if, uh, if uh, you know, information is shared in the public domain, uh, in the media, uh, then the, there will be a, a lot of uh, a kind of comments that may be constructive, but there may, that a lot of comments that may also not be constructive. Or if there is information of a confidential nature that is being discussed, then of course, ASEAN prefers that that confidential information is not leaked to the public before uh, some uh, move can be made. So I think um, I would say that different chairmanship, different chairmanship have different approaches. I think um, for, for Cambodia's chairmanship, uh, it was transparent in the sense that Prime Minister Hun Sen uh, was also, uh, he was, um, he could defend his decision, even though there were criticisms about his uh, decision, how to go about the approach during 2022. He could defend his decision because he had the experience of dealing with Cambodia's own peace plan and effort. But I think he also um, also publicly uh, uh, acknowledged that uh, the authorities in Myanmar, the State Administration Council, Senior General Min Aung Hlai, um, uh, was not receptive to his uh, proposal. So, um, so he, he also, uh, you know, uh, saw 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 the kind of uh, response uh, from the uh, the Myanmar side from the State Administration Council on um, his proposed approach. So I think, as I said, you know, different chairs have different approaches, and this year we are seeing the quiet diplomacy approach. Of course, speaking as think tanks, uh, whether Asian Vision Institute, uh, whether from where I'm sitting, speaking as people in the track two in the think tank, we are in the business of analyzing. Um, all these developments because we want to understand the situation better and we also want the wider public, you know, the audiences to also uh, be able to maybe understand the situation. So when we don't have enough information to uh, to discuss or analyze or assess, so sometimes, you know, that is maybe the drawback of too quiet in a quiet diplomacy. Of course, ASEAN always has uh, what you call behind the scenes diplomacy, quiet diplomacy. Uh, but at the same time, uh, when we don't have uh, a lot of the relevant information, uh, our analyses and uh, knowing the context is also a little bit affected in terms of how we can provide um, recommendations in that sense as track two, as the think tank or the policy researchers. Mr. Chaylin's second question looked at um, uh, the, the letter that was publicized uh, from Foreign Minister Redno, uh, which declined uh, the, the recent, um, uh, the, the, the invitation to the recent informal dialogue in, in Myanmar. Um, uh, well, the, you know, the, the letter for me, it, it was quite, um, a, quite a lesson in a diplomatic language. Uh, I think uh, it is it is important here to recognize that uh, Thailand's uh, move for an informal dialogue among foreign ministers only elevated uh, the initial uh, actions from track 1.5 to policy track, which is track one. 
So I think we need to uh, remember that kind of differentiation. It's no longer uh, track 1.5 about neighbors' concerns, but uh, the effort is to try and uh, bring this up to a kind of like a policy track, even though uh, the statement, the invitation said it's an informal dialogue. But nevertheless, it is uh, for at, at foreign ministers level. And again, um, what the current approach is, is to try and talk to as many key stakeholders as possible. So uh, doing a track one policy track level kind of uh, dialogue uh, with uh, just one of uh, the key uh, stakeholders from Myanmar, I think, uh, is not within that kind of a broad framework of response. And it also, I think, um, this meeting, uh, this informal dialogue proposal, is uh, it, it took place just uh, you know a few weeks before ASEAN foreign ministers are supposed to meet for their annual meeting. So um, you know if this uh, happened during Cambodia's chairmanship, if another country tried to uh, do something that uh, say a, a, a strong and uh, you know uh, ASEAN chair uh, leading the process should 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 do uh, without prior consultation. I, I think, uh, you know, uh, any chair, any country, uh, you know, any member state uh, assuming the chairmanship of ASEAN would also have concerns about, you know, centrality and, and chairmanship and leadership on, on, on an important uh, an issue. So the, the, the point here is that, you know, uh, ASEAN, ASEAN's unity of purpose, ASEAN unity of approach. So, so right now we we see that there are certain countries who disagree uh, with um, with uh, these kinds of unilateral approaches uh, because it doesn't help ASEAN centrality. If you if you are asking me to think about what is the rationale behind Thailand's initiative, uh, I I am not a Thai uh, I am not sitting in the Thai Foreign Ministry, so I won't know what the rationale is behind Thailand's decision. I mean, they would have their own concerns related to their own uh, kind of bilateral situation. Uh, you know, with the with the border, you know, sharing a long border with Myanmar, as well as the kind of political and economic history and experience and interactions uh, bilaterally between uh, Thailand and Myanmar. But I think what has uh, emerged this year quite clearly also is that the neighboring states of Myanmar uh, are showing that they have concerns and these concerns uh, also need to be discussed. So I think that's one information point that uh, the current ASEAN chair and uh, future ASEAN chairs uh, can also take into consideration how do we also uh, bridge that, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the regional, the broader regional position, as well as the concerns of the neighboring states, but to have it in a more uh, coordinated manner such that, uh, you know, uh, the divergence uh, of positions within ASEAN due to different national interests or policies does not affect the overall uh, regional direction uh, that that every uh, member state needs to pay attention to. So uh, I, I hope, uh, Mr. Che Lim, uh, my, my uh, observations address your concerns. And um, I, I would invite you also to look at some of the analysis that uh, ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute researchers uh, in, in the ASEAN Studies Center and in the Myanmar Studies Program have been presenting as our analysis as, uh, you know, track two as researchers. Um, there's also another uh, question from an anonymous attendee, uh, but I think uh, the questions have been addressed also in my response to Mr. Che Lim. Uh, the anonymous uh, attendee question was my view about the uh, uh, Indonesia's quiet diplomacy and the effectiveness of the uh, Office of the ASEAN Special Envoy and uh, whether or not uh, we expect any major change. So I think the first question, uh, we've, we've, we've talked about it. Uh, Indonesia's approach is different, and uh, the, but what is new is that uh, for, for me, I think the significant uh, change uh, different from the previous approaches is not just the, um, the, the different engagements with as many 
uh, of the uh, stakeholders in Myanmar as possible. So there is this inclusive nature, the inclusion. But I think also starting in the, this year, Indonesia's chairmanship, there is an acknowledgement that uh, the views and voices of the ethnic stakeholders in Myanmar are, are important. Uh, usually, looking in from the outside, ASEAN has largely left Myanmar's uh, ethnic um, kind of the, the peace process and uh, Myanmar, the, the Myanmar state's interactions with or the Myanmar state's uh, behavior towards the different ethnic uh, groups and uh, the ethnic organizations, whether they are ethnic armed organizations or now uh, since 2021, the ethnic resistance organizations. The, the ASEAN members largely have left the Myanmar state to deal with what they view are okay this is internal but now because of the Myanmar crisis that erupted uh, after the coup uh, the realization now is that ethnic voices and views and aspirations matter there is a broad vision that uh, stakeholders in Myanmar have towards a federal democracy and therefore I think uh, I think what's new is is this a uh, more attention now being paid to include the, the voices and the views of the ethnic stakeholders in the many engagements that um, ASEAN uh, under Indonesia's chairmanship uh, this year is, is uh, you know, experiencing. Um, the second question from the anonymous attendee asked me, what do I foresee when the chair moves to Laos next year, well, you know, I'm I'm not a fortune teller, and I don't have a crystal ball to gaze into for questions and for answers. But what I can uh, try to an analyze from uh, findings is, if you will give me a, a few minutes, uh, Dr. Ngo, I'd like to uh, share my screen again about the um, uh, the Southeast Asian views in 2023 uh, from the State of uh, Southeast Asia survey. Uh, that my institute uh, does. Uh, hang on, let me just uh, make it larger. So in the 2023 State of Southeast Asian survey, you can see that with regard to the Myanmar question, most of the Southeast Asian respondents are now neutral. And if you look at which of the countries have more neutral views, you can see two countries pass ASEAN chairs, Brunei and Cambodia. The, 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 the respondents uh, from these countries now hold more neutral views about the Myanmar, uh, ASEAN response to the Myanmar crisis. And Laos as the incoming ASEAN chair also holds neutral view. Respondents from Singapore express the strongest view that uh, why the five point consensus seems to be not working is because of the state administration council's intransigence. Interestingly, the respondents from Myanmar mostly view that the five-point consensus doesn't work because of the design. So is it the design or is it because of non-compliance? Um, it is also interesting to see how different stakeholders across the region, I mean, when I say stakeholders, I mean the policy respondents of uh, each of the Southeast Asian countries. So this is the regional picture. If we go deeper, uh, if we look at each of the country attitudes, choose the statement that best reflects your view about ASEAN's five-point consensus on Myanmar. Uh, this is where regionally we saw that, um, you know, about over a third, slightly over a third of the respondents regionally in ASEAN are neutral, and uh, where the most neutral views are are were in the past uh, ASEAN chair countries, Brunei, uh, forty-eight over percent. Cambodia, 56 over percent, and in the incoming chair country, 61 over percent um, felt that they are neutral. So, so this is, this is uh, reflecting also, I guess, if we look at this, uh, as you are well aware, the State of Southeast Asian Survey done by the ISIS Yusuf Ishak Institute uh, is a policy elite. Uh, it's for people who have some kind of input to policy or who can inform policy from where they are sitting. So, you know, this is what we are seeing already in terms of um, uh, Laos's attitude. And then there were questions in the survey about moving the Myanmar issue forward. 
And uh, you can see the, the full survey online, of course. But uh, here in this summary slide about the question about, you know, how do we move the Myanmar issue forward compared to the responses in 2022? We can see some changes in responses in 2023. Uh, the preference in 2023 is still continues to be strongest about engaging in independent dialogue with all key stakeholders in Myanmar. So you will see that because it, it was also over uh, one third of the respondents having that view, I mean, close to 40% uh, in 2022, that trend continues this year. And this is also one reason why uh, Indonesia is trying to uh, engage in independent dialogue with as many of the key stakeholders as possible uh, through its um, quiet diplomacy approach this year. Uh, there were other uh, uh, questions about uh, how do we move the Myanmar issue forward. Um, the appetite for having uh, kind of like a coordinated response together with the international community, the appetite seems to have dropped from last year to this year when it comes to having a coordinated international approach. So there is some, uh, I think, a uh, view that, oh, it seems ASEAN centrality and ASEAN is expected to do it. And the international uh, community, uh, the mem members of the international community uh, do not seem to be interested or they seem to just, you know, place the responsibility on ASEAN. So I think that's also maybe fueling that um, a coordinated approach with the uh, international community um, may not be so uh, feasible in, 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 the, in the views this year. Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, harder methods. If you look at it, harder methods to effectively curtail the State Administration Council, um, there's a slight dip from 2022, uh, views in 2022 to views in 2023. Uh, basically, um, it's about close to 20%. Uh, there seems to be more uh, views about expelling Myanmar from ASEAN, but uh, ASEAN's uh, overall position on this is it is it is the 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 State Administration Council that is not complying with the ASEAN recommendations, and so ASEAN would I think hesitate to punish the people of Myanmar because if Myanmar is expelled, I think, and, and this is my personal view, it becomes much more challenging for ASEAN to even do what it is doing right now. The only legitimacy of the approach that ASEAN has right now to have some kind of constructive intervention in Myanmar is because of the five point consensus and the fact that Myanmar, the state, is a member. It's not who is sitting in Nebido as an ASEAN member, but it is Myanmar as a state, as a country that is uh, a member. And ASEAN holds to that. So ASEAN, I think, at its core, does not want to abandon the people of Myanmar uh, to, to suffer. Uh, a fate uh, in, in, in the sense that if, if the country is outside any international or regional mechanism for intervention. Um, and then um, what is interesting here is um, the preference for non-interference has increased almost double uh, from the previous year. So I, I would encourage uh, uh, audience members to visit um, the, the full survey findings to, to look at it in detail. What I want to uh, highlight in a snapshot is the different country attitudes. So you can see if, uh, if we want to look at uh, what might be the Laos approach, of course, we only have current information. We don't know how Laos policymakers this year may act on this kind of current information. But looking at all of uh, those uh, regional, um, regional uh, level kind of um, preferences on uh, the different ways of how to move the Myanmar issue forward. And then if you look at how different countries in ASEAN, uh, you know, the, 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 the respondents from the different countries in ASEAN, how they look at it. So if you look at the responses from Laos, uh, over 40% of the Laos respondents prefer the uh, engagement in independent dialogue. Uh, in Indonesia, there's a uh, 50% of that preference. If you look at the option on mount a coordinated approach, uh, if you look at the respondents' views from Laos, only 12% seems to favor this approach compared to almost one third last year. 
if you look at harder methods utilization, again, views from Laos, uh, the, 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 the appetite was not that much uh, for the previous year, and the appetite is even less this year. Similar for uh, expelling or suspending. Then if you look at the appetite for non-interference uh, from last year in Laos, over 20%. This year it's over 43 percent. So I think um, so I think um, I don't have a crystal ball, but um, you can look at uh, this type of survey as a kind of uh, maybe a reference guide. And I hope that addresses uh, the the um, the anonymous question. Thank you very much, Ms. Oh. Uh, we are very lucky to having you here in this uh, lecture and then a lot of uh, information we can a lot of input we can uh, gain and also we have a lot of uh, question flooded not only to the question and answer box but it flooded to my also messenger and telegram and a lot of those questions are uh, relating to the quiet diplomacy of uh, Indonesia and as we don't have much time may I select only some of those questions, three maybe, and then uh, we can we can uh, have a good answer from you because uh, as a, a very good expert and you have uh, get, uh, contact a lot of uh, like uh, document and uh, uh, join a lot of uh, session. So uh, the question is about the uh, perspective of the quiet uh, diplomacy of Indonesia. Uh, what progress can it make? Because uh, as Cambodian, you have raised already different chairmanship, different approach, different uh, uh, step. And we are okay doing like a loud step. We are going, we, we are setting along the five, con uh, five point consensus. We are pointing the uh, threshold envoy. We go to set up the dialogue uh, between stakeholder. And then all of these things come uh, out loud transparently and with consultation with uh, those ASEAN members. And then uh, come to the Indonesian membership or chairmanships, and they take the uh, quiet diplomacy. And because of it too quiet, that's why as the think tank, we are very difficult to analyze what is happening. And we cannot see the perspective what will be at the end of the chairmanship. But as you have involved, in a lot of session and uh, uh, contract with uh, many documents. Suppose maybe you have some perspective and can share with us. Thank you for the first session and then we go to another. Thank you. Okay, so again, this is about uh, the difference between Cambodia's uh, approach and Indonesia's approach. Uh, is, is, is that it, Dr. Ngo? Yeah, so again, the main, yeah. Sorry. Yes, it is. Yeah. But uh, we would mm -hmm. like to uh, to to know your perspective, uh, perspective about the progress of this quiet diplomacy. All right, the progress. Well, I think um, we have seen now three different ASEAN chairs uh, try to develop uh, the different approaches. Uh, during Brunei's chairmanship, um, the special envoy Dato Eriwan didn't even manage to get to Myanmar because the State Administration Council kept kind of like stonewalling, you know, setting conditions, preconditions for his visit until he felt that um, it would not uh, be constructive at all uh, to, to go under those conditions. And, and, and so we see that during Brunei's chairmanship, um, the, the special envoy uh, could not um, fulfill his mandate uh, in a manner that uh, was mandated by the five-point consensus. At the same time, it was also during Brunei's chairmanship that the, the precedent now of uh, the non-political representative criteria has been set and that has been upheld. So uh, we can say that different uh, ASEAN chairs also learn from the previous chair's experience and try to also present their own, um, own mark, their own um, uh, imprint upon the process. And we saw that clearly during Cambodia's chairmanship, as I was saying, uh, starting from your leadership downwards, Prime Minister Hun Sen really took the leadership during ASEAN Chair Year of Cambodia, and he was transparent. He defended his decision to go to Myanmar because he felt 
that with Cambodia's historical experience of striving for peace and reconciliation, he could have something to share with the generals in Nepido. And he went with that good intention and he announced it, even though there were questions, there were criticisms. He, he, took, he took those criticisms and he responded to them. So we see this different style of more, more transparent and also, uh, you know, having the, the courage to, to, uh, to also to, to, it, to pronounce as well as to defend uh, the, the, the decision. But what Prime Minister Hun Sen uh, found out quite soon is that uh, Senior General Min Aung Hlaing had a very different view of what uh, Cambodia's chairmanship could do regarding the Myanmar crisis. And because the State Administration Council tried to manipulate the diplomatic space created by the ASEAN response uh, to uh, the Myanmar crisis, uh, the State Administration Council also is working on past experiences and they thought, okay, if we have the ASEAN diplomatic space, we can try to manipulate it. We can try to leverage that. And, and so trying to use Prime Minister Hun Sen's visit and even the visits of Mr. Prak Sokhon later on as uh, pointing to, oh, see, uh, see, ASEAN is recognizing us, the State Administration Council. Uh, we are the only uh, legitimate uh, body uh, for ASEAN to discuss. So they try to pro pro project this, this kind of uh, little bit wrong image. And, and so that is the manipulation. So knowing that uh, whatever kind of uh, diplomatic efforts at the high level that an individual ASEAN chair can do, could be manipulated to that extent, I think that was um, Cambodia's experience. Uh, nevertheless, um, Foreign Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Praxor Khan made two working visits to focus on uh, humanitarian assistance because the realization was that if the State Administration Council is so intransigent, so stubborn uh, in um, the, all these discussions related to um, uh, the, the, the five point consensus, at least for the humanitarian assistance priority, can ASEAN try to uh, facilitate some headway? But even then, I think there were a lot of um, experiences that showed that the State Administration Council really wanted to scope or manage things their way. Different from 2008, ASEAN's um, humanitarian assistance delivery just basically stopped at the airport and then the local partner, the Red Cross Society, uh, took over for the delivery and distribution. And when ASEAN convoy uh, tried to have some kind of partial humanitarian assistance delivery, uh, we saw that there's some uh, unknown perpetrators attack on the convoy. So I think Cambodia's experience highlighted also um, how how the, the the ASEAN diplomatic space had a potential of being uh, manipulated or leveraged by uh, the, the the military regime in Myanmar, and uh, that experience served as a um, lesson for Indonesia to try a different approach. So they try go back to uh, ASEAN's uh, behind the scenes backdoor diplomacy. They call it quiet diplomacy, and they try to implement the uh, meeting with the different stakeholders. Now, Mr. Praxokon tried to do that, but he tried to do that and uh, tried to do it transparently and openly by asking, I want to see this person, I want to see that person, I want to see many, many of the political uh, stakeholders. And again, uh, during his uh, working visits, uh, many of those requests were not uh, acceded to. You know, uh, the State Administration Council said, OK, we will consider it. We will consider the possibility. We will let you know. We will confirm. But when the visit actually happened, many of those uh, requests uh, were not met. So Indonesia's approach is now to kind of like take it out of that and as a chair independently uh, try to reach as many stakeholders as possible on neutral ground, uh, also respecting their safety, because of course, um, uh, their safety in meeting with the special envoy um, or, or, or the ASEAN chair representative uh, needs to be considered. So that's what Indonesia is doing. So I would see it as different chairs have different approaches that have also set different precedents and provided uh, important uh, learning points for future chairs. Um, 
and I think uh, it's important that you know ASEAN has always been very uh, kind of um, uh, try to be creative and uh, flexible in uh, trying to pursue its uh, its uh, priorities. And I hope uh, for the sake of the Myanmar people, uh, this will uh, also continue. This creativity, this commitment to creative approaches will continue. But what the realization has set in now with three different chairs, the realization is setting in that it's going to take time and patience. So ASEAN now probably needs to think of, okay, yes, the long-term vision is there, five-point consensus, long-term and so on, but what is our medium term? What are the medium term uh, actions that we can do or the kind of uh, specific uh, uh, maybe deliverables that we can try to do during the medium term? And at the same time, I think um, ASEAN also now needs to think about preparing for tomorrow, yesterday. And what I mean is, because of the long-term nature, because of all the suffering that, has, uh, that we have seen uh, happen uh, to the people of Myanmar, the different communities in Myanmar, there's still suffering going on. Even, even when the violence and the killings stop, there's so much pain and trauma and suffering, and there's going to be huge rebuilding and recovery needs. I think a country like Cambodia knows very well how challenging that recovery and rebuilding process was. And that is where the reconciliation uh, process sets in. So I think when I, when I talk about we need to prepare for tomorrow, yesterday, is ASEAN also needs to start thinking about how can we also further help the people of Myanmar when all the, the killings and the atrocities stop and, it, and the time comes uh, for rebuilding and recovery? Because as we have seen, international attention is very distracted. They will turn to the next crisis happening in another part of the world. But here in Southeast Asia, you know, Myanmar is in Southeast Asia and um, Myanmar is part of this region. So the response and the, 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 the I, I think the assistance to the people of Myanmar will still uh, be something that will devolve to the shoulders of the ASEAN member states to help with uh, that recovery in the future. Thank you very much for your answer and a good perspective that uh, Myanmar will get stable and get peace. And we need to prepare, like you'd say, tomorrow, yesterday, that is a, yes. a good point, it's, very it's, good point. It's heartbreaking for me to say it because, you know, what's happening in my country, it's now in the third year. And, and as you can see from all the numbers, the humanitarian and the, the humanitarian needs, the food insecurity needs, they are mounting. Um, but the sad tragedy is that uh, the, the, the spiral of violence has not stopped. And uh, because of that, you know, um, it's, it's heartbreaking to, to say that this crisis is... is not going to have an immediate end but you know we can only pray for the violence to end and then when the violence stops then we can try to find how to uh, help the healing process um while i have some time i would like to um uh just give a reference for the audience members to um and can can we go to one more question okay because okay I, I, sure. I filter and we still have one more question that's okay, not the sure, same sure, as sure. Uh, the other but before that let we say like uh, cambodia are concerned also uh the situation about uh myanmar all cambodian people are with myanmar and we wish you all the best and we wish you peace in uh in myanmar and now we go to the uh, third question as you have a book uh, writing about in the ASEAN India, and we also would like to uh, to ask about the role of Asia uh, of India with Asian and also uh, China's role with Asian toward the Myanmar crisis. And uh, right. please. Though that, that, that's a very important and pertinent question. Of course, um, when we talk about neighbors' concerns um, in in ASEAN, of course, Thailand. As, as a neighbor of Myanmar, that's, 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 a, that's one part of it. And uh, Thailand has uh, significant uh, investments in Myanmar since before Myanmar even became a member of ASEAN. And um, uh, it was also uh, part of Thai policy to, to, uh, to 
actually, you know, convert. But I, I think during uh, the time of Prime Minister Chai Chai Chunavan in Thailand, there was this uh, policy shift about converting the battlefields into marketplaces. So that was one way of trying to look at uh, the economic development, uh, you know, uh, being a pathway towards uh, engaging and also uh, bringing about uh, the kind of development and hopefully uh, stability uh, such that, you know, uh, former countries in cri countries formerly in crisis situations could uh, then stabilize and become you know, members of the regional community. Uh, why I bring up this this uh, this approach is because there there were similar views uh, shared by other two countries sharing very long borders with Myanmar, and that's China and India. And because of the the historical nature of uh, you know um, coups happening in Myanmar, basically. Uh, in the aftermath of the 1988 coup, when there were broad-based sanctions uh, imposed uh, upon the military regime at that time, uh, the, the economic uh, kind of, uh, I guess, reliance or the interdependence really shifted to uh, neighboring states. And uh, that is how uh, China uh, has uh, enlarged its its presence, its economic uh, presence in Myanmar. It has a very large footprint in terms of the kind of investment and infrastructure projects it wants to do. And uh, similarly, uh, India has also sought to uh, enlarge or, or, you know, have a wider uh, type of uh, economic and investment presence. And so when we look at neighboring countries of Myanmar, the interests are of course, intertwined with these type of um, uh, bilateral uh, economic relations, as well as uh, border security uh, considerations. And so I would uh, encourage uh, audience members to think about those dimensions uh, when we consider uh, the, 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 the nature of either India or China's attitude uh, and views towards Myanmar. Uh, there are also certain geopolitical considerations um, and uh, they are all intertwined. So I think that is how that is how we need to look at um, the uh, the the attitudes and views uh, of, of uh, these neighboring states of uh, Myanmar when it comes to trying to uh, address the current situation. And at the same time, of course, these are these two countries are also important, uh, you know, in the in the sense that they are they are dialogue partners of ASEAN as well. But I would also recall that um, China uh, has tried to show that with regard to ASEAN's response to the Myanmar crisis, uh, they they at least uh, are showing some kind of uh, regard for ASEAN centrality. I should say Indo India also uh, followed suit for, for the high level meetings uh, that have taken place um, in, in China or in India, or hosted or chaired by China or in India, they have tried to follow the non-representative, uh, non-political representative criteria. But of course, you know, that is at the higher political level, the working level interactions all continue as we know. Okay, thank you very much. We, as I said, that this topic is very interesting and our audience are uh, throwing to us a lot, a lot of questions, but uh, due to the time, because we plan to finish on 11, now we much already, already have an hour over the time. So mm -hmm. I would like to thank you very much for your uh, presentation, your insightful uh, answer and uh, for joining us in. We hope and we hope that you will join us again, participate with these public lectures again to, to give uh, other progress on the Myanmar crisis. And as I mentioned before, Cambodian people are with uh, uh, Myanmar people. Yes, we wish you, we pray for you peace and stability. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me the opportunity and I'm happy to provide more information to any interested member of the audience uh, for the questions. The Myanmar issue is, is very complex and I think uh, only now uh, the broader ASEAN community is also seeing and appreciating how complex the internal dynamics are. 
So as I was mentioning, it's, it's heartbreaking for me as a Myanmar citizen uh, to, to, uh, to see that uh, this crisis uh, will, will not have kind of like a quick or an effective uh, kind of conclusion, uh, but now uh, looking at uh, the nature of the complexity and, and the, the, the needs and the aspirations of the key stakeholders involved, um, ASEAN itself is uh, now looking at this in terms of requiring both patience, flexibility, but also also commitment. So again, I thank uh, all um, all the ASEAN uh, members and the chairs who have tried to uh, show that commitment and also to take into consideration, uh, I think, the views and aspirations of um, all the stakeholders uh, whose future uh, is at stake uh, in Myanmar. Thank you once again.